get to that point where there's too much you need to do to grow your business. Nobody has a crystal ball. The thing that drives me nuts with all the data points that come out is there's a 30 to 60 day lag on almost all of them. But if somebody really knows their market, it's more than just being able to spit out that research. So jumping from your W-2 job to doing $40 million in your first 18 months where most people fail out, what did you do differently in the first couple months in real estate that allowed you to see success pretty quickly? Starting off, it's all about finding clients or finding leads. How many people do I have to reach out to today if I'm cold calling? Or how many networking events do I need to go to? Or, you know, whatever it was, how can I get in front of as many people as possible? I think for me, where not having a real estate agent who was a mentor, but having business mentors, they were able to help me put some of those systems and really put a real estate business together. And what I see a lot of agents do that makes it really tough for them to scale is so jumping from your w2 job to doing 40 million dollars in your first 18 months where most people fail out at the beginning in the first year what did you do differently in the first couple months in real estate that allow you to see success pretty quickly? Mm. I think starting off, it's all about finding clients or finding leads. Like there's, I think a lot of people make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so for me, I just tried to start tracking the metrics that I could use to really find my first client. And from day one, that was kind of how I just thought through things. And so it really wound up looking like, how many people do I have to reach out to today if I'm cold calling? Or how many networking events do I need to go to? Or, you know, whatever it was, how can I get in front of as many people pos as possible? And then how can I track that so that I'm doing it on a consistent basis? I think that was, if I were to really narrow it down to what I was doing, that's how I was trying to think about it from, uh, from the gate. Okay. And I think I saw you spent no money on ads. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, for the first six months or so, I spent no money on ads and then did really hyper-targeted ads after that and can get into what that looked like. But initially it was really uh, just sphere of influence and people that I met and networked with. And what I think is really interesting about that and what I think a lot of agents get wrong is when they define their quote unquote niche, it's way too broad. Where for me, I said, I have a little bit of experience in the investment space, so I'm gonna work with real estate investors. And I, I could have stopped there and said, I'm an investor agent, just like people will say, I'm a first time buyer's agent or luxury or whatever, but that's not even close to as narrowed in as you need to be. And so for me, I said, well, I know a little bit about investing. There's some agents who are doing big volume working with house flippers. I don't wanna do that. Um, I, I'm going to work with a lot of either first time investors who have enough money for a down payment, but not enough to go buy properties cash. And so they need a loan. They need a little more hand holding. There's specific things that they need. And I'm going to be the best person in Nashville who does this. And so that was really, I think just narrowing down uh, my niche was what really kind of helped me propel forward instead of spinning my wheels and trying to work with everybody at the same time. So I would imagine being a new agent, like the fear of narrowing yourself and especially with investors, why did you choose investors instead of the traditional route? Yeah, I looked at it and said, really, what is nobody else doing or where is there something that I can learn about where I don't see as much competition. And I think a lot of agents just go with the default of first time home buyers when they're new. And it's like, well, well, sure, but you're competing against, against everybody else who's in your office who's sold less than five deals this year. So for me, it was just trying to find where I could have a competitive advantage um, and then really moving forward from, from there, I guess. So wouldn't an investor kind of say, well, 
why would I work with you? You're brand new. Like that. So that's always mm -hmm. something like new agents are thinking no matter what, like, oh man, I have to put up this front of like, I've been in the business or I've done this mm -hmm. many deals. So how did you overcome yeah. that? Especially with investors? Yeah, that's a great question. Really what I would do. So early, early on, I would leverage that inexperience. And thankfully for, for me, I had that little bit of background working at an investment fund. And so I said, Hey, I came out of the real estate investing industry. They didn't know that I was an intern and then like a low level analyst at the fund. So I just said, Hey, I came out of the investment industry and I have, uh, I, and I run a boutique shop where I only work with a certain amount of clients at, at a time. And so as a new agent, it was, it was completely truthful where I only worked with a certain amount of clients. It wasn't because I had a line of a hundred people coming through my door, but I said, Hey, I, what I do is anybody I work with, I give them a hundred percent of my attention and I'm going to be here. You know, if you call me, I'm going to either pick up or I'm going to respond within 15 minutes and I'm going to make sure that I can flex everything I'm doing to fit your schedule. Cause yes, I'm new. But that also means that I'm not passing you off to somebody else who's new on my team. I'm the one who's going to be working with you and you're not going to find someone who's going to work harder uh, than me. So I think that pitch really helped at least put people at ease because with investors, they do know a little bit more about real estate. And so they need somebody who's going to be the workhorse and they can, uh, can vet some of the properties or they can make some of the decisions on their own um, if somebody's bringing them to them. So I'm thinking in my head, like you kind of knew who you're targeting. You had the idea of positioning, like where did, cause most people don't just come out the gate, like, and know that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's extremely unique that you did like, where did that come from? Yeah, I think it came partly out of just necessity where I said I need to be able to find people quickly and that was kind of the default. But I think part of it was just taking a look at, you know, what I had potential to be good at and what I didn't or who my clientele could be where, and I guess really recognizing where my strengths and weaknesses were, where I knew I wasn't the luxury guy. I, at the time was a 24 year old kid and I'm not going to be selling the country music stars homes. Uh, they're not going to trust me to do it. So instead of trying to pose as that guy, uh, really backing down and essentially just humbling myself and saying, look, who might trust me or who could I work with? Uh, and then trying to build that clientele from there was a, a, just a better frame of mind to be in rather than trying to compete with the top agents in my brokerage. Makes sense. And did you have a mentor early on? Someone you like who helped in any way? So early on, uh, I had, I always joke, I say YouTube was my mentor. Uh, there were a few, <laughs> you know, YouTube channels or podcasts that I would listen to. I wish I would have found this one, um, or th wish this one was around cause this is exactly <laughs> the kind of material that I was consuming. Um, I joke about it because I didn't have a real estate agent mentor. I had business mentors. And I think that was actually what allowed me to scale more quickly than most agents. And I, I use this analogy now when I'm working with, uh, with clients of mine. I say, well, if you want to go build a house, you'll go learn from a contractor. You'll go find a contractor. They're good at building houses. But if you want to learn how to run a construction business, that contractor probably isn't your person because they're good at the technical skill of building houses, but not the strategic skill of running businesses. And so I think for me where not having a real estate agent who was a mentor, but having business mentors, they were able to help me put some of those systems and really put a real estate business together early that then it was just learning how to sell real estate and how to interact with customers and, and learning the product just like you would in any business. Okay. And who is like one or three like people that were your YouTube mentors? Yeah. Oh, I got a, uh, I listened to bigger pockets a lot. So because I was in the investment space, all the bigger pocket shows were great content just to really get into the mind of my prospective customer. Uh, and then I also do some investing in real estate myself. And so it was kind of a double edged sword to listen for both reasons. And then, uh, Tom Ferry had a lot of good content, listened to him, watched a lot of his YouTube, uh, stuff. And then if I'm going to find a third, Tom Ferry. 
some of the early Graham Stephan stuff when he was really working as an agent. Uh, I liked watching a lot of that because he had a, a solid approach for being a solo agent and how to just position yourself in the market. And especially he was a younger agent at the time and really felt like his stuff spoke to me as a younger agent starting out. Nice. Um, so getting a little tactical in the weeds of like prospecting, like what were a couple sources that you're like, cause I, I think I saw or heard that you actually reached out to realtors to build like one list. Cause you have, you had multiple lists that you were building at a single time. Um, so you had people on each side of the transaction, like what were some things that you were doing like daily, like to build that list and like, who were you kind of targeting? Mm, yeah. So one of the big resources that I used was Facebook groups. And so I would go into Facebook groups for investors in the area and this, I used investor Facebook groups, but there's a lot of groups for just, you know, buy sell trade groups in cities or connect whatever in your city and so i would go into the investment groups and just really either start cold dming people i didn't love to do that because everybody gets a million dms from people who are cold dming them <laughs> but i would try to find their information and then call them and just say hey uh, i know you're looking for properties what are you looking for is there anything i can help with and i would always approach it as just, hey, I want to draw connections with you and other investors in the area and build that social capital instead of, I'm an agent, sign an exclusive listing agreement with me or an exclusive buyer agreement and don't work with anyone else. That That's an immediate turnoff. So I took, I'd try to play the long game and just say, oh, I heard so-and-so has a single family home that they're trying to sell. You might want to connect with them. And I'm not going to get their business today, but then when I do bring them a property or when I uh, have something come up, they're going to want to work with me because I was able to provide some value up front. Okay. And I think I heard that you were pretty proactive in finding properties. Like you would go and look on Zillow, the MLS, and you'd go look for older properties that have been on the market longer or might be getting overlooked because of price. How important do you think being active versus like the passive, let's just put this person on the mm. MLS search. How yeah. impactful was that for you? Or I think how that important? Was, yeah, I think that was everything. I mean, I think if I didn't do that, I would have maybe closed an eighth of the volume that I did, where it would start with the pitch to any prospective client where I said, look, I'm, I'm an active agent. Like there are three ways that I'm going to go find properties for you. One is I'm going to set you up on the auto search so that if I'm away from my desk or showing property, you don't have to wait for me to come back and reach out to you. So you'll get those listings automatically. Text me if something comes up. I'm also going to CC myself on that search. And this worked early on where I would CC myself on every search. Once I had a bunch of clients, I would basically just get all of the new listings in every morning and go through them once in the morning and once before I'd sign off at night to see if there was anything that looked good for clients. And then I said, if I see something that looks good on my end, I'll reach out to you. So if you missed it or you were away, uh, I'll reach out to you proactively. And then third is off market where I'm constantly putting feelers out to other agents in the market or other brokerages, trying to find where those off market deals are and letting them know that I have somebody interested and I'll let you know if anything comes up. So those that pitch really i think landed me a lot more clients because they they're used to the agent who will just put them on an auto search and forget about them uh, and then actually backing it up and being active i think was huge where for me a, a lot of the systems i put in place were just to remind me to reach out to these five agents who work with investors in the area that i built up kind of through those facebook groups or over time or whatnot and i would try to reach out to you know five to ten a day even if it was just a quick text message saying hey uh you know had had something come up i'm looking for xyz do you know of anybody who has anything and i'd always phrase it as do you know of anyone because then it doesn't come off as uh as needy yeah. it's again just making connections nice that's good it's coming off uh, like you're not saying, hey, can you work with me? You're trying to build that value and that ask uh, so that when you it does come to fruition, it makes way more sense. So, Exactly. Um, 
I know me, like, for example, when I started uh, with the builder years ago, like I was able to consistently go into like the CRM, go look at tasks every day, go do it. But I know some other people, they might be daunted at just that Mm. tedious task of like, okay, (laughs) what do I have to do today? Let's go down the list. Let's do it. Like, why were you able to stick with that like so consistently like how yeah um i will say that it's easier to talk about now and say i did this every day there were <laughs> plenty of days that i missed i think theory yeah. is always you know theory is always 100 percent, but uh people aren't and so there were definitely <laughs> days i missed but i tried to be as consistent as possible just because uh really I knew that if I focused on those lead measures or those things that I could control on how many people I reached out to, that the deals would come. If I focused on getting deals closed, I, I knew that I was going to get commission breath or I'd start to sound needy or I'd just, I'd turn clients off because I'm just thinking about the numbers. But if I just focus on, okay, today, here's what I did to reach out to X amount of people or write however many offers or whatever I can control, um, it really made me focus on the process instead of the outcome. So I think tactically what I did there was with the CRM, you're exactly right. I got caught in the in-between of, I need to build a system and I don't have time to build a system here. So what I would do is I would initially just send myself emails every day from my CRM. I could do that where uh, it would just say, hey, here's your tasks to do, or here was yesterday's Like, here's what you did yesterday. Here's what you need to do today. And that way it was just one email. I could see whether I passed or failed yesterday and move on. And I didn't have to spend hours in my CRM trying to, you know, move stuff through pipelines and whatnot. Okay, nice. So when I think of kind of the client acquisition funnel, uh, you have the front end, which is like, you have to get the awareness. You have to actually get the prospect to know you, who you are and then you have to get them to like you enough to either give you something whether it's an email whatever and then mm-hmm. it's the trust like the no like trust to get them yep. to actually work with you when you think of that process and you kind of look back at what you did what did you kind of have in place at each like part of that funnel let's call it mm. <laughs> um that allow you to get clients yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's something that I actually get really excited about talking about because it was probably the number one thing that I used to both start out and then scale for getting clients. As I think about the real estate business in, in five pieces where you've got the awareness, basically turning prospects into leads, you know, people who are going to buy from somebody and turning them into leads who they're going to buy from someone and they know who you are. Um, then you got to move them from leads to clients where they agree to work with you. Um, once they're clients, you got to figure out how to get them under contract uh, and actually get an offer accepted and then get contracts to closing um, that whole transactional, you know, admin process. Uh, and then once they've closed, getting them to come back as repeat clients and be clients for life. And those five areas, I really started to dive in and that that business background and the business mentors that I had kind of said, Hey, in order to build a business, you need to be able to one measure and to improve on your system. So I took those five areas and just drew out an entire list of what needs to happen in each one of these. And it started at, you know, step one, like you were saying awareness. Okay. How do I make people aware of who I am? Well, I could do social media. I could do an email newsletter. I could network. I could cold call, just write all of those down then move on to the next one. Okay. If they're going to become a client, how do I get them to know, like, and trust me? Um, and went all the way through that process. And it gave me a really good roadmap of what to work on really for the next six months where I could look at that list and say, okay, I'm not good at these three things, or these are the ones that I really want to focus on. And I had a a visual representation of how I could get better. Uh, And the crazy thing is, and this is what I wind up working with uh, real estate agent clients on now, is if you can get 5% better at each one of those five categories, and let's say you're making 60 to 80 grand as an agent right now, uh, if you can get 5% better at converting through each one of those stages, you double your income. So just like those minor tweaks add up and compound. And that's what I think is just 
wild. And I think ultimately that was the big thing that let me scale quickly was focusing on each of those five areas when I had downtime or time to work on my business. Okay. And so if we kind of take that and we go like a little micro into it, like I know you did cold calling, um, you did a couple other things. Like what, if you had to say like these one to three things worked for me and mm. kind of like this stage, this stage, this stage, what were some of those? Yeah. So if we're getting really tactical initially for me, it was, yeah, the, the Facebook groups, bigger pockets, I would go and just add value message people on there to just find other real estate investors. Um, the cold calling would work well. Um, it, I had varying responses to cold calling, but I think the overall, just the, the Facebook, uh, messages, bigger pockets, and then networking events were big where for me, I'm an extrovert. I love talking to people and just getting out in front of people where I could share my expertise or the, uh, you know, what I knew about the market. Uh, those were the best ways to get clients, especially in the beginning. So were those like realtor networking events or different types? Different types. So for me, a lot of them were investor networking events. So it would be the equivalent of if you're not working with investors going to, you know, it depends on the area, but uh, anything from a rotary club to a, um, you know, if you have kids going to the softball tournaments or the soccer tournaments or whatever, um, or just community events where I would always just ask the question, uh, you know, how many other realtors are going to be there? Cause there will be others, but I don't want 30 other real estate agents there. I want to be one of very few. And so I stayed away from realtor networking events. There were a few that I went to where it was like, come get free dinner and hang out with other realtors. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go to that, but I don't want to hang out with my, essentially my competition. <laughs> that doesn't really help anybody. Yeah. I went to several realtor events early on. It's like, it's just this constant, like, here's my card and it's yep not really yeah. productive <laughs> for business. For sure. So I totally yeah. understand that. <laughs> yeah, you leave feeling good about yourself because you handed out a bunch of cards, but uh, no business comes from it. <laughs> yeah. So I imagine for you, in order to scale to like 20 million in volume a year, you had to condense like meeting people and you couldn't mm. just meet people one-on-one. -on -one. You had to meet people more at scale. Uh, is there like some things that you did for that? Yeah. So what I really did is I tried to just narrow in my focus on what is going to be the highest dollar per hour tasks. And so meeting people, even meeting people one-on-one -on -one was still doable, but I would try to put little things in place to uh, improve the quality of those meetings. So I'll, I'll use an example where I, at first, when a new lead would come through, and especially once I started paying for some leads, when a new lead would come through, I'd hop on the phone right away with them. And that wound up being a waste of time a lot of times. And so I put another layer in my business where I sent out an email right away and said, hey, you know, in order, to, here's a little bit about the market, whatever, in order to honor your time, I'd love to set some time up on the calendar where we can sit down and talk. And then they could book a call with me. And then I put a little video intro together uh, on that email as well. So they could watch a video, they could read about the market, and then they could book a call. So by the time we hopped on the phone, that was a very warm lead that I basically just had to not screw up and I would land uh, that client. And it saved me a lot of time talking with leads that weren't necessarily going to pan out. Um, and so things like that, I allowed me to scale up. And then when I would do, I didn't do any kind of lunch and learn events or any one to many sales, uh, opportunities there. But the main thing that I would do was just free up my time doing everything else, trying to automate as much of my business as possible so that I could constantly be going out and finding new leads or, uh, writing offers. Okay. And we'll touch on the automation a little bit. Um, and the reason I was asking is because I, I had someone on past week, Jazz, he's done like $2 billion in real estate. And that's kind of the mindset that he's had mm -hmm. is he said, and he's worked with investors. That was his target kind of client. And it was always scaling 
from one to many it's like okay mm-hmm. i'm talking to this and then he had events and then he went to webinars and now he's doing yeah he has his podcast so it's like at each level he just kept going one to many even more yeah. um so where did uh you said you mentioned ads and leads like there's a lot of different places people can spend their money mm-hmm. where did you find like the best return yeah the so the only place i found a return on my ads and i tried a few <laughs> different things uh i bought leads from bigger pockets and the the way that those leads worked was they were essentially pay-per-click investor leads where they were already uh warmed up they put pushed them through like a questionnaire beforehand and then they had to click on which agent they wanted to reach out to and so i said hey i, I like bigger pockets let's test this out it was a brand new program when i started and <laughs> then i wound up getting these really solid leads that came in and same thing where they already knew who i was uh, that kind of added fuel to the fire. It was a an expensive lead program for you know an up. It's an upfront. It wasn't a referral based, but it was well worth it. Uh, and still, you know, to this day, the only leads that I have bought, and I still buy leads from them and refer them uh, out, just because they're they're still really quality leads. Hmm. That's interesting because it sounds like the Zillow model, where it's like Zillow built the traffic platform. Mm-hmm. And then they just sell you the leads. They're going to be expensive, but they're high intent as long as you work them. Uh, yeah. And that's been like the best return. You haven't found any other places that really matched it yet? It has as far as paying for leads and because it was so niche. I think partly because I okay. was, you know, that was the client that I worked with. I even created kind of a niche within what type of leads I'd try to attract there. It worked really well. Um and did work to the point and you know whatever for whether it's disclosure or just interest uh, i now uh, do affiliate with bigger pockets because i was like man these leads are awesome and i'll talk with other agents about it because it has worked really well for me um but i think the big thing was yeah those that quality instead of quantity where i tried some uh tried some facebook ads and honestly for me i just I'm not good at running social media ads. And so if somebody else was running them for me who knew what they were doing, I think I could have seen a return. But uh, for me, it was really finding those targeted uh, targeted leads who were my ideal clients. Yeah. And Facebook leads, it's like 1% conversion, three yeah. if you're really good. <laughs> like, it's like really, it's really tough business at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, You seem like like a high D personality, but then you also have this level of like math research, like you're an analyst in you. So it's very interesting if you kind of teeter on both personalities, because I would be interesting to see a disc personality to see if that's actually correct. I don't know if you know. (laughs) Yeah. I, I haven't taken the disc assessment. I need to, because a few people have said that they're like, what? you're kind of confusing (laughs) and it, it does. Um, I think for me, it's a mix between the two, just because I've always been in the the business world where I have to be analytical, but I also have to, um, you know, make decisions and kind of play that visionary role and be, um, you know, be building whatever it is that I'm building. So I, yeah, uh, I'd be interested to see also. So, Something that I've seen a lot of people that I've interviewed with, they have this deep like curiosity to like research, really like either understand their market, like their product, like really hone in to like being the best and knowing the most. Is is that kind of the stance that you took when it came to like real estate investing? Absolutely. I I think that people like to work with experts. And so I was always curious on, you know, what's going on in even this subset of whatever neighborhood. I see there's three new developments going up there. What's going on? Or I'd go down to the city and ask what was, uh, what plans were in the works for commercial developments or whatever. I was definitely curious on just becoming an expert, partly because it was just interesting to me and partly because I knew that a client would be or a lead would be more willing to work with me if they know that I understand the market instead of just I was the business card that they happened to not throw away at some event. So 
it's interesting that you say like knowing the market because a lot of people talk about knowing the market. It's like, oh, you got to know the market. But like, what does that actually mean mm. to you? Like compared to just being able to spit off this many listings, this many pendings, like what's kind of the difference in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's knowing the market as it is right now and being able to project the market in the future where nobody has a crystal ball, but if somebody really knows their market, um, it's more than just being able to spit out that research where, okay, everybody gets the same data on listings, pendings, all of that. Um, that's just parroting information that you get, but really knowing the market is knowing you know, who has uh, a bunch of property that they're getting ready to move or who's buying up in these areas or what's been the trend in uh, these subsets that maybe you, you either have to dig really deep on data that's available or it's before it even gets to the data. The thing that drives me nuts with all of our real estate, um, kind of all the data points that come out is there's a 30 to 60 day lag on yep. almost all of them. And anybody who is using that data to inform their decisions right now is already behind. And so as an agent, your responsibility is to, you know, understand where the market is so that two months from now, that understanding gets confirmed by what comes out in the reports. Yeah, and that's huge. Like the data that even for realtors, like on the front end, like the ones that uh, the realtor boards and stuff show, like monthly that's 30 days behind and then when you just think of like like you just said like closings pendings that happened 30 to 60 days ago so mm. if you're not really keeping a fine tune then you're just going to be behind yeah. if you're trying to use the data that comes out today to inform like oh this is what's going to happen tomorrow yeah exactly so uh i was curious because you're someone who is analytical like what are some signals that you look for like whether it's a market whether it's a deal some things that you that signal in your head like okay this is an opportunity mm. i think this this is going to sound really elementary for a second and then i'll expand on it it's really supply and demand is what i look at and I think where people get stuck and what I've seen a lot, especially in the last couple of years, and so pretty much throughout my career as an agent and even before, everybody talks about either supply or demand, where in COVID it was, oh, there's not enough houses and the demand, you know, we're 5 million houses short. Um, but nobody really thought through that, okay, that's one side, like where our supply is low, we're, we're short on housing just because mortgage rates are at 2% and the demand is so high. If mortgage rates go up to six, our demand shrinks and then it's not nearly as imbalanced as people think. But nobody was thinking that way a couple of years ago. And now it's the same thing where everyone says, wow, the, you know, there's no supply because everybody's in this lock-in effect because houses aren't moving. And I was like, well, yes, there's no supply for the demand, but also if interest rates come down just a little bit, yeah, demand's going to go up, but supply is as well, because these people who are holding off on selling are going to sell. And so it's just, I think people oversimplify that equation to the point where they, they like reading the headlines and then parroting those instead of thinking one or two layers deeper to, okay, why is it this way? Okay, if interest rates go up, what are the three things that happen? Or, you know, just really digging deeper and thinking through it more. Okay. And last before we go into like the systems and automation how did you build your off market list like did you just keep a list of like okay this person's interested but they're just not selling like walk me through that process a little bit yeah so specifically with investors this one was really fun where my off market list there were a couple of different ways to do it where one would be sellers where yeah they i w would reach out to them and they said hey you know i'm not interested in selling or here's my price it's through the roof whatever and then if i had somebody who was interested i'd come back to them the one that was really interesting to me was working with wholesalers where a lot of agents don't like working with wholesalers for good reason there's a lot of stuff that goes on it's a lot of uh, extra work but 
I always really enjoyed it because they're searching for deals all the time. And it even uh, brings it back to some of that social capital where what would happen is wholesalers would have the deals that they could go make their 10, 20 grand on whatever, and they would go flip the contracts and assign it to somebody. But they had a bunch of properties that didn't quite fit their buy box, but they knew the seller was interested in selling. And so what I would do is I would figure out with them, I would never say, oh, I'll give you some commission because that's illegal and you can't do that. But I would either just say, hey, if you have something that comes up, you know, just let me know uh, if there's a seller that has this type of property or whatever. Or, you know, if you have something under contract, I can represent the buyer and I'll work with you on that. And the way that I would try to build that off-market list was, again, very relationally oriented where I would typically try to just send my people over to wholesalers directly where they'd want to go assign a contract if i knew that one of my people was interested in it uh sometimes i would just even say hey uh you know either pay me one percent on this deal and we can get it through or whatever um, for that client or just here get this deal done i'm not going to take any commission but just let me know if there's anything that uh comes up like if there's properties that you're not going to put under contract but you know the sellers are interested in moving and that relationship basis i think brought you know i mean that brought me five figures for sure um deep five figures uh throughout my time because they would just start sending me stuff that were dead leads to them but uh it built up that relationship as well okay nice so now transitioning to you're doing like one, two deals, and then you scaled up to three, four, five, six, seven a month. Like what systems did you have to put in place in order to have that capacity and be able to focus on, let me go prospect, let me get deals consistently? Yeah. So the systems that I wound up putting in place are basically everything in the middle of the funnel where once you know how to get clients and once I had built up that side of my business, I needed to learn to retain and uh, get repeat clients. So it was really a lot of automations in my CRM to start where new leads would come in. If I was nurturing leads, I needed that to be automatic. And so I put a newsletter together. Uh, I put different funnels in place for buyers and sellers and whatnot to get them into my system so that I could then build my brand as the expert before they agreed to even work with me. And then I would really just outsource things, uh, even for example, showings. I would always show the first few properties to clients and then I use this service. I'm surprised that the uh, that the company isn't like a unicorn by now. It's called Showami or Showami. I don't even know how to say it, but oh, it's yeah, like I've Uber for showing agents. <laughs> it's yep. great. And uh, I use that all the time and wound up, you know, I would either FaceTime in for showings, but it saved me an hour, hour and a half of driving or I would just connect with my client after and that let me leverage some time. And then I really would just, the CRM I was using helped with everything with transaction management and then review management after and keeping those clients engaged in my newsletter and uh, all of, you know, they wouldn't forget about me after the property closed. Nice. So what were some of the things, cause you talk about systems and automation, a newsletter is a little less systematize mm -hmm. what, what were some of the things that you would incorporate in your newsletter to send yeah so i think people resonate really well with stories and so i would usually try to include stories about recent closings uh, whether it was myself or somebody in my office or just a cool property that i saw that moved that my clients missed out on i would try mm -hmm. to include some sort of story just basically showing that I had a pulse on the market or showing that I was keeping track or producing or whatever uh, without having to go in and spit a bunch of facts. So, and I feel like people would read more of those as well, where I said, Hey, here's how we, uh, you know, here's how Johnny made $10,000 the way the day he moved into his house because we had an appraisal that came in high or, you know, whatever. And I put some nugget in there that keeps building that expertise as well. Nice. So keeping it stories so you could tie in like the emotion as mm -hmm. well as sharing any lesson or tips, stuff like that. Yeah. Nice. And did you send out like off market deals in the newsletter or just like new listings? 
Mm. So in the newsletter, it was mostly just authority building. So I didn't send any of those in the, the newsletter that went to everybody. What I did with the off-market deals, and this was really, uh, I think, another selling point where I would send those off-market deals to any clients who were working with me first, and then, and by clients, anybody who had signed an exclusive buyer rep agreement, and then, you know, a couple of days later, I would send it out to everybody, so that then I could tell people, hey, I'll, I'll work with you as your only agent, or if you want to work with multiple agents, that's fine. But I send off-market stuff to my clients first who have agreed to work with me exclusively. And so I would just put a separate tag in my CRM and had a list of people who were interested in the off-market properties. That way I wasn't, you know, spamming everyone in my database every time a, a deal came through. Nice. So moving past that towards the like contract to close and then after the close, what part of the, tr like what automation or like what, what do you put in place in both of those places mm. that not helped you scale necessarily, but helped you do it more efficiently? Yeah. So contract to close, the first thing that I did is I did paperwork on my first deal that came through and then hired a transaction coordinator. <laughs> and I think any agent who's still doing their own paperwork needs to go pay the money to have somebody do it for you. Uh, at the time I was at EXP and I think it was like $150 a transaction or something really, really low to have somebody do that. Now I think I pay five, $600 a transaction, uh, but it's well worth it where from contract to close, then I really don't have to do much of anything. And a lot of the, the systems that I was putting in place there was really just training that transaction coordinator on how I wanted things done, where I would empower them to you know, write up, uh, a lot of times I would just be able to text them what I needed in an amendment or in a repair proposal or whatnot. I could send them the inspection report with a, a voice memo and they would draw it up for me. And I said, Hey, I'll, I'll pay you extra to do this, but this is going to save a lot of my time. And so being able to more leverage to people or to a person specifically for that transaction coordinator was big in that contract to close stage. Um, and then the only other thing that I did, and I did this uh, more recently, and I work with clients on it now, is putting together just a series of videos. Like if you were to just ask me, hey, what happens in the inspection period? And I were to then say, talk through it for two minutes, and then, oh, what's an appraisal? Talk through it. And sending those out you know, on a, a schedule for a typical 30-day close, just informing your buyers or your sellers on what's happening just if they have questions. I think that's a good way to stay in front of them as well. So that was really contract to close. And then post-closing was just put them back on the, the newsletter drip. I'd try to get their birthday uh, to try to, you know, be able to reach out to them on their birthday. It, if it didn't happen, it wasn't a huge deal. Uh, and then also just really trying to keep them updated if there were things going on in the neighborhood where I would typically, uh, if I could, I'd set them up on a sold drip campaign for the MLS so they could see what sold in their neighborhood after. Um, and then really it was just uh, trying to collect that review and staying top of mind. Okay. Um, so some people might think, well, paying well, the 150 is one thing, but 500 transaction and then you, I guess I'm, what I'm curious about is because, I mean, I know I have it. I know some people I know don't have the same mindset when it comes to their business of like, hey, let me pay here. Let me pay here for time. Did you did you learn that somewhere or did you just kind of like out of necessity have to pay for stuff that bought back your time or where did that come from? Yeah, what what I will say is I even now struggle with that, with buying back time. I am in a mastermind group and I told one of the other guys in the group, I said, hey, I am at the point now where I have to force myself to spend this money. So I'm either gonna spend it on people that, it, people and processes and whatever that help my business or I need to go give it to like a, a charity that I don't care about or like the opposing political party or whatever, like something where <laughs> it incentivizes me to actually buy my time back. Um, and that's 
kind of now what I'm thinking through. But when I was starting out as an agent and really starting to buy that time back, I was really just looking at what is my desired, uh, how much do I want to make per hour? And anything that's going to be less than that, I need to outsource. And it it was tough to do at the start, but I pretty soon realized that even if it was a you know eight thousand dollar commission and I'm giving five hundred of it up, there were some deals where it was an eight thousand dollar commission. I'd pay ten percent to a showing agent to show all of the properties to the client, and then I'd pay five hundred to a transaction coordinator. Um, and so, really, yeah, I'm giving up. $1,300 on that transaction and then a flat fee for my brokerage. I'd give up two grand, but that $6,000 that I then made was for probably five to 10 hours of work. I was making close to a thousand bucks an hour. Uh, and that to me, when that clicked, I was like, wow, okay, yeah, let's, let's just figure out how to bring more clients in the door to make a thousand dollars an hour, uh, instead of trying to do all this paperwork myself. Yeah. And that, then it just becomes a math equation at that point. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So now you kind of play the integrator role for like other agents. What are the maybe three biggest mistakes or the three biggest lessons that you see going in and helping other agents? Yeah. So I, a lot of what I wind up doing is kind of managing that same tension that I felt when I was starting to scale my business is you get to that point where there's too much you need to do to grow your business, but you have to take time away from serving clients in order to build that. And so now what I do is just saying, Hey, keep serving clients, hire me and my team, and we'll do all the backend stuff for you. And at a really high level. And what I see a lot of agents do that makes it really tough for them to scale is uh, they either, and there's, there's kind of a spectrum here where they either are uh, greedy. And when I say greedy, it's not in the typical sense. It's they want to get to the passive income machine so quickly that they're going to go drop a ton of money on hiring a bunch of people right away and putting all these systems in place and doing too much before they're able to handle it as a leader or before they actually have Uh, actually have the systems in place to manage the people and the new lead gen and the new transaction coordinator and all of that. Um, So they either try to scale too quickly or they're, and this is the more often one, is they're too afraid to scale and too afraid to start spending money. And the opportunity cost winds up becoming so great for them uh, that they, they're stuck where they're at instead of being able to grow. I think there was, uh, I listened to Layla Hermosi's podcast and she was talking about that recently. And I was like, yes, that's, that's it is yes, you're fine making a hundred, 150 grand a year as an agent, but the opportunity cost is making, you know, five, six, 700, a million dollars a year. Uh, if you were to start making some tweaks and scaling. So you started a team, which is kind of now you're seeing that play out. How's that? What are you learning now as you build out your team? Yeah. So what I really enjoy and the way that I run my team has been very much on just a a referral basis. And so it was a more structured team when I was uh, full-time in Nashville. I'm out in California now and really focused on uh, my company out here. And so it's a lot of referral basis or I'll do essentially, you know, instead of consulting for equity in a company, I do consulting for a portion of the commission with team members. And so if they want me involved on a deal, I'll hop in and have a high level investment conversation with their, um, their client or whatnot, or I'll send them leads. I think what I've learned as a team leader, especially when I was doing it full time out there is you you're always going to be better off working with people who are absolutely crushing it and could do it on their own and letting them build their own business instead of trying to control everything and push them down to get a bigger cut for you or whatnot. You'd rather have uh, an agent who closes, you know, uh, 10, 12, 15 deals a year and is a, a higher producer on your team. And, you know, you only take 10, 20% rather than somebody who's, you train up and spend the time with to get them started. And then they're only doing two to five deals a year or whatever. Um, even if you get a bigger chunk, it's just a, I think healthy team structure is empowering others 
to become better instead of trying to push them down so that you look better. Yeah. Build up more leaders underneath you. So exactly. Makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I want to go back to that point, the opportunity cost of not growing um, that you talked about. And to that agent that's maybe they're making 100K a year, 200K a year, and not necessarily that they're happy, but it's like they feel like they're on that hamster wheel of always trying to get the next deal to make the next paycheck. What What are you learning is the most impactful change that they need in their business? Yeah. Um, most impactful change kind of tactically in their business or mindset wise? We could go both. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd say mindset wise, I think the fear of, um, of making a mistake is something I see over and over in that range where they get caught up in the, Oh, I made 200 grand this year. What if next year is only a hundred grand or what if I screw up and have to start over or whatever. And I think the shift that needs to happen is basically just saying, yeah, what if, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know how to be a great agent. You've done it. You've made, you know, if you're at a hundred to 200 grand a year, you're already a top 10, top 5% agent. So you know how to get there. Worst case scenario, you're set back a couple of months because you tried something that didn't work. Best case scenario, now you have a new floor, like 200 grand isn't your ceiling now that you can hit, that's your floor. And now you're gonna be making a lot more money. So mindset wise, I think it's the, the willingness to try things that might not work out um, and taking that leap of faith. And then tactically, I think it's the, the same kind of curse of the solopreneur uh, where you've got to let stuff go. You got to put, you got to leverage people, you got to leverage systems and technology uh, and really start to try to buy your time back so that you can reinvest in your business. Say you're working 60 hours, you got to find a way to start working 30 so that you can fill those other 30 hours with higher leverage opportunities. And usually you see that in like, for example, one form of people is transaction coordinator. One form of technology is the CRM, the back end. Uh, is there anything else kind of within those sides or anything similar? Yeah, I'd say just kind of as you move through those five layers of a transaction is one, start paying for leads or find a good way to you know leverage your brand, whatever that looks like, million different ways to do it. But leverage your brand, leverage, uh, pay for leads, then it's CRM automation, follow up with those leads, uh, automatically. Uh, then it's, you know, it showings leverage t other people's time with showings or figure out ways to partner. Then it's transaction coordinators. Uh, and then post close it's leverage technology again with, you know, Google reviews or geo targeting without getting way too far into it. Like you can do some cool stuff um, with driving more business from the business you've closed. Nice. So being someone like yourself, who've gotten to what you've already amassed, and then now you're building another business and you're constantly having to push yourself and you're constantly having to learn, push back past your own like limitations, barriers. What do you like? consuming you mentioned like Layla Hermosi uh like how are you continuing to grow and what are your some of your sources yeah I think the biggest one that I've had to kind of reshape my brain on even and and there's some sources that I really go back to and read but I had to actually delete the podcast app on my phone <laughs> and delete audiobooks because I was taking in too much information. And I think there's a point where once you know what you need to do in your business, uh, I found myself just listening to the people that I like listening to because I felt productive. Um, so I had to turn that off and instead figure out, get back to really the basics of my business and say, what do I need to learn? What do I need to grow in? Let me only consume media if it's during the workday. Like if I just want to go listen to Alex or Layla or Mosey instead of watching Netflix, sure, let's do that. But when it comes to business, really keeping uh, in check the intakes that I have and only listening to 
uh, and watching content that is actually going to help me grow uh, and scale my business or actually only consuming content that's actually relevant to the next problem I need to work in on my business or stuff that's actually going to make me a better business owner. Okay. And you mentioned like you're in a mastermind earlier. Is that kind of one source now? It's like putting yourself around other people that are at another level in business? Yeah, absolutely. It's the mastermind I'm in. It's the Better Life Tribe. Uh, Brandon Turner has a mastermind and it's been great where I'm in a small group uh, within that tribe of other entrepreneurs and business owners and people who can really push me and are in the same stage of life. So it's a lot of fun where we get to see each other grow and develop and also uh, get to ask the hard questions and really uh, kind of you know do the iron sharpens iron thing uh, in helping us grow and scale. Nice. So kind of looking forward, looking at like the industry, like what you're trying to build, there's AI, there's all these things that everyone's like either worried about or the world's whatever. Like what's your thought, I guess, on the future of real estate and technology incorporated into real estate? Yeah, I think the first thing is I think that it's going to happen slower than everyone thinks. Uh, right now, everyone thinks AI is going to take over the world next month. It's like, well, it's you know, it's <laughs> going to be a longer process. But I think it's something that people need to embrace. Where if you look back to uh, the agents who were around when the internet started, there was a big shift in where the business went, where it went from being hyper local to now whoever was well known on this thing called Google or once Facebook came around, well known on Facebook. You know, there's there's always changing mediums or changing ways of doing business. And the ones who learn to leverage those and actually learn to integrate them into their business, those are the ones who are going to come out on top. Uh, if you're trying, you know, if you're trying to build for the next 20, 30 years, if you just want to sell real estate this year and then retire and hang out on the beach, sure, do whatever you want. But growing yeah. a business, you have to be able to leverage that changing landscape um, and really stay on top of it. So that's that's kind of where I see it. I don't think anything's getting replaced. I don't think that agents will be replaced by AI uh, at least anytime soon. I think there's a human element that people uh, people do need, but I, I think that the winners are going to be the ones who don't run from it, but they embrace it. So is there anything that you're embracing right now? Any AI or anything you're using in your business? I use AI a fair amount for writing content workflows, doing a lot of some of the automation stuff. Uh, I'll wind up putting a lot of it, at least the initial copy through AI. And so I'll say, you know, give me five different options for follow up templates or follow up campaigns in my CRM or whatever. And it'll spit those out. Um, it, I think it's great for idea generating and I'll use it for that as well. If I say, Hey, create a content roadmap for me doing X, Y, and Z. But then from there, I definitely need to tweak it because as much as chat GPT sounds more human than I think any of us would have thought, it doesn't sound human enough to replace uh, my voice or sound like me. So I'll use that. I haven't used a lot of the other AI tools uh, as far as, you know, any of the Photoshop stuff just isn't, too applicable to what I'm doing. Um, but you know, chat GPT, Bard, those have been good. Yeah. I like Bard cause it, you can actually take data from today. Uh, yeah. cause chat GPT is still back in 2021, mm -hmm. but then I do love chat GPT to get you off the ground. Cause yeah. a lot of times you get stuck at like zero or 10%. And it could at least get you to like 50, 60, maybe 70%. But then you have to come in after yeah. that because there are a lot of nuances it still will not get. Yeah, absolutely. So. And it's, but I mean, 50, 60, 70%, a lot of times can be, call it five to 10 hours on a project. And if you're wanting to make a hundred bucks an hour, there's, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars you just saved by, uh, by leveraging it. Yeah, exactly. So I want to thank you for coming on, sharing everything that you've learned in your business. And uh, where, where can people follow you? Where do you put out most of your content? 
Yeah, most of my content, uh, you can find me on Instagram. It's TonyClark.RealEstate, or uh, I have a newsletter that I send out, so you can find any of that stuff. at It's at AgentOS.io, so agent, like real estate agent, and then OS. Uh, dot io so either one of those feel free to dm me on instagram if you got any questions and always uh always happy to help nice so yeah everyone check that out check him out on instagram and join his newsletter